What's up guys, welcome to Rotor Riot and welcome back to Learn to FPV. Today's going to be all about flight controller. So I'll run down the different types of specs that you're going to find on flight controllers and just try to help you figure out which one's going to be the right one that you need. Okay, so the first main spec of a flight controller is whether or not it's an all-in-one. And as I've said before earlier in the series, all-in-one isn't really the best word because it doesn't do everything. It really just does two things. An all-in-one flight controller is a flight controller and it's also your power distribution board. So take this one for example, not only is it controlling the way that my quadcopter flies, it also is distributing the power from the batteries out to the ESCs. Now if you're running a 4-in-1 speed controller, this isn't really a necessity. So if you have a 4-in-1, you can go either way. You can get an all-in-one flight controller and just not use those pads that would be meant to power your individual ESCs. But on the flip side, if you have individual ESCs, it's going to be a lot more convenient to have that because if it doesn't have the pads for distributing that power, then you need a separate PDB or power distribution board. Like this flight controller, for example, doesn't have the power pad, so you're going to have a double stack like this. Your power leads will go to the PDB and then your signal wires will go to the flight controller. Other flight controllers that are going to be called all-in-one may have some additional features. Like this one, for example, it's a flight controller, but it's also a 4-in-1 ESC. So we're getting a little more into all-in-one, but it still doesn't do everything. There's other ones that will be a flight controller and a receiver. And then there's some other ones that will be a flight controller and your video transmitter. But again, all-in-one isn't the best word because there's not a flight controller that does everything. Um, now, when you get into mixing different components, like 4-in-1 ESC and a flight controller or a video transmitter and a flight controller. It can be convenient, it can save size and weight, but also you're trusting one component to handle multiple responsibilities. So there's pros and cons there. It's, it's going to be a little bit easier to set up. It can sometimes save you a little money, but then if it breaks, you're replacing two parts with one board. So you have to think about that. Okay, next up we have different sizes. So your standard flight controller you most commonly will find is a 30 by 30, but there's also smaller 20 by 20 flight controllers, and then they get as low as 16 by 16. Now, this is typically gonna match up with what size frame that you're gonna put it in. Smaller frames are not gonna be able to fit bigger flight controllers. Sometimes a bigger frame can still fit the smaller flight controller. And through the different sizes, they can all pretty much do all the features that you need them to do. The main thing to take a look at is if it is an all-in-one, meaning that it's a power distribution board and flight controller, you need to make sure that it can handle the current that your setup is going to draw. So a lot of times with the smaller flight controller, they, they can't handle as many amps going through them just because the circuit board itself just doesn't have enough copper in it to handle those amps. The next spec, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here because A, I'm not an expert on this, and B, it's it's a little over the heads of the beginner, but there's different gyros that different flight controllers will have. I'm pretty sure they, they pretty much will all work. I don't think there's a gyro that's like, oh, no, just totally stay away from that. It's not going to work. It's garbage. But it's just something to maybe keep in mind and do your own research on if you're interested in that. But not all flight controllers are going to have the exact same gyro in there. So some have been known to perform a little better in some situations. Some are a little better over here. There's pros and cons. But again, I just pretty much try a flight controller. If it flies good, I'll keep buying that flight controller. I don't really think about which gyro is in it so much, but it's just something to be aware of. Another feature that most flight controllers are going to have, but some don't, so it's a good thing to be aware of, is whether or not they have an on-screen display chip. You can usually see it, it's this longer rectangle chip on the board, and this is really handy to have. I highly recommend getting a flight controller that can do on-screen display. If you don't know what on-screen display is, it's, it's text that can be overlaid on your screen and give you information. So it can tell you your timer, how long you've been flying. More importantly, it can tell you the voltage of your battery, so it gives you an indication of when you need to land but there's a long list of things that it can display to you. I really only use a timer voltage and milliamps consumed. So that's telling me how much I've pulled out of my battery, what the voltage is and how long I've been flying. So between those three things, I have a good idea of the health of the battery, whether or not it's about time to retire it and not use it anymore. 
and you know obviously it tells me when to land so i'm not over discharging my batteries causing them to deteriorate faster i'll be honest sometimes i'm guilty i know my battery's low but i, don't, I just keep flying anyways don't recommend that but you know sometimes we just get reckless the prices of flight controllers that do and don't have on-screen display is they're all pretty much about the same price for flight controller so if you find that one doesn't have it and one does again i highly recommend go with the one that has on-screen display it's going to be really useful okay another thing that some flight controllers will have and some won't is soft mounting and there's a couple different versions of soft mounting so almost i think pretty much every flight controller is mounted to a drone the same way there's holes on the corners these are going to slide over some standoffs or some screws and that's how it's held down. What some flight controllers do like this one, they make those holes a little bit larger than they need to be and then they put a rubber bushing in there. That way the vibrations from the motors and the propellers are not getting sent into this as much. There's some dampening in between the motor and the gyro. This can be really important because even though you can't see it, this thing is gonna have these little tiny micro vibrations that can really send extra noise into that gyro and just affect the performance of it. So having that soft mounting is really helpful. Another form of soft mounting is some flight controllers will actually have the gyro itself soft mounted. So it won't be hard soldered directly onto the board. It'll be on like a little ribbon cable and then on some sort of little soft pad. And this combined with also soft mounting, the actual mounting of it, it just gives you even more smooth gyro performance. One thing to take into account is if you have a really tight, low profile frame, sometimes that soft mounted gyro won't fit. It's gonna fit in almost every frame, but just for me in particular, I fly really slam down frames and they don't fit in mine, so I can't use that. But almost every other frame in the world, they will fit, it's not a problem. A big thing to take a look at is the input voltage capability of your flight controller especially on a all-in-one flight controller, your battery is gonna be plugged directly to this. So you need to know that it can handle the voltage that your battery is pushing out. So it's gonna say it's either good for like two to three S, four to six S. So again, just make sure the voltage of the flight controller is gonna match the battery you intend to use. Or if you already have the flight controller, make sure you know the voltage capability of it and you get a battery that's gonna work with it and not blow it up. Sort of in the same line and related to that is the different regulators that's on the board. So just about every flight controller will have regulators to take that input voltage that you start with and drop it down for other components because almost everything on the drone is gonna connect to the flight controller. So you need to make sure it's got an output that's the right voltage that's gonna work for your camera, for your video transmitter, for your receiver. They're pretty much all going to have the correct ones, but some will do it a little bit differently. So some will have a 12 volt regulator, which is really good. It's gonna work for most of your video transmitters, but then some will have a nine volt regulator and not have the 12 volt, which in some cases could be better because if you're running a 3S battery, you're really at about 12 volts anyway. So it can kind of struggle to regulate a 12 volt voltage because you may be going below 12 volts. The way that regulators are meant to work is you start with a higher voltage and then it can step it down and keep it smooth and constant. Especially for your video gear, you want good clean regulators because of the spiking in voltage and the fluctuations and changing can cause interference in your camera and your video transmitter and just give you overall less video performance. So there's not really a spec to look at on the product page that's gonna say, I mean, it probably will say that the flight controller has good regulators and really clean power going out to your video components, but some are better than others. And it's just gonna take some experience and talking to people to figure out what they're having good success with. Another spec of the flight controllers is what kind of processor does it have? So you've got F1, F3, F4, and F7. I think that's pretty much all the different processors. Basically, the higher the number, the more powerful that processor is. So the more it can handle doing. Pretty much every flight controller you're gonna find now is either an F4 or F7. We started off with F1 and it had you know, limited capabilities. F3 came out and that really raised the bar. And now we're getting into even more advanced things that we can do. So like, so what do I mean by that? Within the flight controller software, there's different features that you can enable and there's different refresh rate speeds that it can run at. So 
what I mean by the refresh rate is, uh, like I mentioned in the ESC video, the way that the flight controller is working is in a cycle. So it's checking where you're at versus where you should be based on how you move the sticks, what correction needs to be made to bring that back in line. It makes the correction and then it starts that over. So a better processor can handle doing that faster. And at the same time in the flight controller software, there's other features that the developers have come up with to improve flight performance. Now with a higher end processor, you can click all of those on, run them all at the same time, run at a really fast refresh rate, and it'll still perform well. If you have a less powerful processor, you can kind of start to run out of processing speed and it just can't handle doing all that at the same time. There's a lot more you could go into about processors, but I want to keep this simple. You pretty much want F3 or better. Most flight controllers you're going to find nowadays are F4. F4 is going to work just fine. If you want to go for something a little more future-proof, you know, the maximum processing power you can get, go for F7, but it's not really necessary. At least F3 or better, and you're probably going to go for F4. That's the most common one. Now related to the processor, because different processors have more or less of these, is UARTs or UARTs. Basically what that is, it's like channels that you can use. So having more UARTs is going to enable you to connect more external devices. So for example, your receiver that you hook up to the drone, that's going to take a UART. That's one of your channels. So if you only have three UARTs, you can use one for your receiver. Maybe you're going to use one for your video transmitter that has some communication channels available to change channels through your flight controller. And then maybe your third one would be used for addressable LEDs where you can flick the switches on the radio and send that information into the flight controller to change the color of the LEDs. I don't use a whole lot of peripherals, so I'm not sure what other things people are using, but it's just good to know that a flight controller either has three or it has four or it has five. It's, it's just good to know how many channels you're gonna have available to let you know what's gonna be possible to hook up to that flight controller. So some things to consider when you're picking a flight controller, number one is what kind of software is it gonna run? There's three main players in the flight controller game. You've got Betaflight, KISS, and Flight One. So Betaflight is gonna be by far the most common, I'm pretty sure. There's It's an open source software, and pretty much anybody can make a flight controller that's gonna work with Betaflight. So you're gonna find a wider range of different flight controllers. Now with KISS, it's Flyduino's company, so only Flyduino is gonna make a flight controller that's KISS compatible. And very similar with Flight One. Only Flight One is gonna make Flight One compatible flight controllers. So there's upsides and downsides. Betaflight, easily by far the most common. You're gonna find the most people using it. You're gonna be able to get help with it, probably the easiest. And it's gonna be the easiest to find a flight controller in stock that will work. Now, I've really mainly only used Betaflight, but a lot of people will tell you that KISS flies better or that Flight One flies better. So that may be true and you may find that. So it just really depends on your experience and what you like. But there's some other advantages, like Flight One, for example, is super easy to set up. Where Betaflight, you kind of need to know what you're doing or you know do some research, watch some videos, and there's different boxes you have to check. There's things that are not intuitive that you have to know to get that thing flying properly. Whereas Flight One has this wizard that just walks you through the steps. It just says, okay, which motor is spinning right now? Is it front left or front right? And it, by you doing those things, it knows the way you've got it set up. It tells you to move the sticks on the radio. It's, it's very easy to get going. I've never set up KISS, so I don't really have much experience there, but I know there's definitely plenty of people that will tell you KISS is the best flying thing you can get. So it may be worth a shot. Again, it's a little more expensive, but also it's probably very reliable because this KISS has a really good reputation for making good products. So I'll leave that choice to you. I don't really have a preference. I just fly Betaflight because it's easiest. I know it and I can find a bunch of flight controllers that work with it, but I'm sure any way you go, you'll be happy. They all work well. They all fly well. Okay, another really big one to think about, and for me, this is probably the number one thing of how I pick what flight controller I'm gonna use, is the layout of the board. So where the different pads and pins are located on the flight controller. Some flight controllers, you're gonna find that some wires are gonna go underneath and some are gonna go on top. 
for me that pretty much immediately takes it out. I want everything to be able to go to the top. That way I don't have to pull the flight controller off and flip it underneath to get things off. That's just a pain, I don't like that. Other ones like this one in particular, I, I like the layout of this board because the, the pads that you're gonna solder your ESC wires to are on the corners and on the outside of the mounting hole. Other ones like this one, they're on the inside. It's pretty much the same either way, but it's just a little bit easier to solder when it's on the outside. So you don't have to worry about that nut that's gonna be there kind of in the way and getting your wires around it. Other things are gonna be like, where does your camera and your video transmitter solder to? It's really convenient if the board fits in your frame so that the camera is gonna be in the front where you solder it to, the VTX is gonna be in the back, because that's typically how it's gonna be laid out. The camera is almost always in the front or always in the front. And a lot of times the place that you're gonna mount your video transmitter is in the back. So it's just a pickiness thing for me. It's like the neatness that I don't have wires crossing. This one goes here, this one goes here. They don't cross each other, it's just convenient. So as a really new beginner, you may not know what you're looking for in layout. This may come later after you've built a quad or two to know what you do and don't like. But it's something to look at. Where are the wires gonna be soldered to? If you know which kind of frame you're going with, is that gonna work the right way? Another thing is on which side of the board is the USB mounted to? You wanna make sure that's gonna go out one of the sides so that you're able to access that to hook up to Betaflight. You don't, you wanna make sure that the way that you're gonna align the flight controller doesn't put it in the front or the back where you'd have to take it apart just to plug a USB into it. Most flight controllers are gonna work the right way that you want it and have it out the side, but it's just something to take a look at. Another thing to think about is some flight controllers will have some special features that make them stand out and be different that other ones don't have. There's not a ton of these, but there's a few. So for example, some flight controllers can support two cameras. This is a little niche. It's not something that everybody needs, but it's a thing. So there's something called a cheater quad where you put one camera in the front and one camera in the back. And this enables you to either fly forwards or backwards and you can switch the cameras. So again, it's not something, especially that a beginner is gonna be playing with, but just something to keep in mind that there's other features. So another flight controller that has a cool, unique feature that I've used is the SpeedEB flight controller. So what it has is a wireless Bluetooth module in it. So you can hook up your phone to your flight controller to do your PID tuning and adjustments. And that's really cool. They do also have a standalone unit that will work with any flight controller, but it's just an example of flight controllers having cool features that make them stand out and be a little different. Another one, and this is again, maybe not a beginner focused thing, is the black box capabilities. So what black box is, is it can record all the data going on while you're flying. So what is your gyro doing? What are the motors doing? And you can use this to help fine tune the quad. This is definitely, I wouldn't say something a beginner is gonna do. I even struggle to understand what the information means and what I need to do with it but it's just something to take into account. So different flight controllers are either gonna have it, not have it, or they'll have more memory that's allocated for the black box. So in some flight controllers, you're only gonna be able to do a couple flights and then the memory's full. Other ones, it'll have more memory available on board. And then other ones will have an SD card slot so you can increase that memory even more. Another one is camera control. Pretty much every FPV camera has different settings you can change. And we'll get into this more on the camera episode, but you can change the contrast, the brightness, saturation, different things like this and make it better for some scenarios and better for other ones. So maybe if you're flying at night, there's some changes you wanna make to make it perform better at night. So some flight controllers will be able to connect some wires to that camera to allow you from the sticks through the flight controller to the camera to change those settings without having to hook up the little adapter board directly into the camera and changing it that way. So again, another feature to look for in flight controllers. Okay, and lastly is to think about the brand of flight controller that you're gonna use. So there's a ton of good flight controllers that will work well, but you wanna try to get a feel for a brand's reputation. Do they make really good flight controllers? Do they have some that are buggy and not so good? What's the reputation over time? What are a lot of people using? If you go to our store, Race Day Quads, Get FPV, pretty much anything we carry is going to be good. But maybe you might find some cheaper flight controllers out there that are not gonna perform as well. So another thing you don't want is cloned flight controllers. A thing that you may find is companies sometimes will take a flight controller and re reverse engineer it and then just 
pass it through lower standard of quality control and make it cheaper. And I've seen a lot of these boards that are just have nothing but problems. They fail easily. They may never work right out of the box. So it's just a good idea. Go with a well-respected brand of flight controller. Okay, so that's gonna do it. I hope this gives you a basic overview of what you're looking at in flight controllers. There's a ton of them out there and pretty much all of them are gonna get the job done. There's just certain aspects that you wanna look at. Is it gonna fit in your frame? Is it gonna have the layout that you need for the other components? What kind of software does it run? These are the main things that you wanna take a look at. So thanks for watching and this has been Learn to FPV.